Hey, Mr. Hamill. Um, my name is Carlton Cartwright, and I am the Executive Director for the Children's Coalition Incorporated. And we are here at the Children's Coalition. And Mr. Hamill, um, what is your birthday? Uh, October 28th, 1924. And what is your current address? Uh, 605 Universe Boulevard, Juno Beach, uh, Florida. Okay. And who else is here? Who is this young lady right here? My daughter. And what is her name? Uh, Margaret Reynolds. Margaret Reynolds. Okay. Okay. Uh, what, what branch of the service were you in? Well, I was the Army Air Corps at the time. Oh, okay. Now it's called... I'm the Air Force. Right. right. Um, what war did you serve in? World War II. And where, where, did, where was it that you served? I served in Italy in combat. Okay. What was your rank? Tech Sergeant. Okay. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, let's see. I had to volunteer for the draft. All right. Um, where were you living at the time that when you en when you enlisted? What was I doing? Where were you living? Oh, in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh huh. Yeah, I thought I heard that Boston accent there. Um, why did you Why did you join? Uh, well, to have my pick of service, and uh, I had to pass all kinds of physicals and uh, mental requirements, uh -huh. physicals and written oral exams. Why did you choose that branch? Because uh, I was interested in aviation. Do you, do you recall your first days of service? Uh, yes, very much. Can you tell us about, you know, when you first enlisted into the military? Well, I reported to Fort Devens, about 20 miles from my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in a group of uh, about 50. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, we shipped out to Jefferson Barracks in Missouri on a train right from Fort Evans. Okay. What were you doing before you went into the service, the military? I was an apprentice printer. And uh, that was just the beginning. Cause I was only about 18 then. What year was that? Do you remember? Uh, 1943. Okay. So tell us about your first days in service. What did it feel like? What about boot, boot camp training? Do you remember your instructors at all? Or? Well, it started early in the morning. We all assembled at Fort Evans. And the first thing they did is we had to raise our right hand and sworn in as a uh, soldier of the Air Corps. And uh, said if we uh, jumped over the fence, we're subject to uh, shooting. AWOL. AWOL. Gotcha. That's the first few hours. After that, uh, we boarded a train, mm -hmm. and they boarded by height. So I was one of the last ones on the train, and there was no seat. So I had to stand up all the way to St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. How many hours was that? Were you from Massachusetts to Missouri? Yeah. We oh. went to Chicago and then down to St. Louis. He was. But I had a suitcase and I sat on a suitcase. Oh, okay. You got a break, huh? Yeah. There you go. Uh, okay, so, so what was, you know, tell us about boot camp. What, what was that like? Well, the first thing they wanted to do was give us a uniform. Mm -hmm. Well, 
They had uniforms for everybody, but didn't have any for me. So. What that mean? So I was in civilian clothes. Right. And I wasn't allowed in a mess hall. So then I had to get my CO, my commanding officer, to give me a note that I have to eat. Right. And uh, so that note was just for that day. So the next day was the same problem again. So that was about my first week in the service. Right. So I, everybody was marching and learning how to march and all that, but I was on an odd duck without a uniform. Right. Hmm. So that was a... First one of those I heard. Yeah. So eventually, come on, we got to get to a uniform here sometime. Come on. Well, I did get, <laughs> I did get a issue to pair of army shoes, uh -huh. uh, and they were very, very good. Okay. Actually, I had one size on one foot and another size on the other, but they were fitted beautifully. Okay. That's just what I needed, and I I had them till I was sent overseas, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't. They said you got to get rid of those, get a brand new pair to go overseas. Right. I said no, I don't want to do that. I said I want to keep these because these fit me. Mm -hmm. So finally, they won. I had to have a new pair. Okay. All right. So, um, what was your MOS? What was your What was your job in the service? Well, I don't know the number of it now, but it was a uh, flight engineer gunner. Oh, okay. Right. Do you remember anything about your instructors at all? No, not so much. They were. PFCs or something like that. Right. It's only basic uh, drilling instructions, and that was about it. Which you you would, I, uh, you served during World War Two. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you go? Well, what, from what theater. Europe. Mm-hmm. Italy. Uh, that's right. You told me. Okay. Where in Italy? Foggia, Italy. Is that, is that north or south? Well, it's just about in the middle. Okay. Almost opposite Rome, uh -huh. apparently. Okay. So what was that like arriving there? What was going on when you arrived there? Well, it was a little primitive. We were, our crew was issued a tent. Well, two were actually, one for the officers, which there was three officers and seven enlisted men. Mm -hmm. So we had to put up our own tent. And, uh, well, basically, when we landed there, there was no airfield. Well, there was no, uh, not actually no airport. I mean, I, it was, it was the uh, had well, steel steel ramps. They had steel packs, mm -hmm. and that's what the uh, the runway and the, was made of, and the taxiways and so. So it was a little bit, uh, it wasn't concrete or anything like that. Did you see combat? Yeah. Were there many casualties in your unit? On our crew, two died in combat mm -hmm. on our last mission. We were shot down over Berlin, mm -hmm. and uh, we were shot down before that. But uh, we were on the way to Berlin, and uh, you know, the target was the Mercedes-Benz uh, aircraft factory. Right. So, but it was the it wasn't a, the mission was a success, and uh, we were awarded uh, uh, some kind of a medal for that particular operation. Bronze okay. Star? Uh, no, it was a, a group thing. Uh, okay. I, you know, I, I, I wish I had the name of it now, but it, I think it's a unit citation. Okay. So that was a. Um, tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences. You were you a prisoner of war? Yeah. You wanna, can you? Expound on that, please. Well, 
a little bit prepared for that because the crews were going down. We were a replacement crew to begin with, mm. and uh, a lot of them had been all shot down. You know. Very few were going home, but uh, we let's see, we we made. Uh, well, we were on that thirteenth mission at the time, and uh, I was shot down around Brux in Germany with the anti-aircraft, and uh, we were also attacked by German jets, uh -huh. a Messerschmitt 262, they go. We didn't have any jets then, but they did. Oh, okay. So that was quite a. But they, they had them for quite a while, but they were short of jet pilots. And Hitler didn't believe in uh, propellerless aircraft. So he held the program back quite a bit. And finally, he, they get in the air and they could cause a lot of damage. Right. Because they were, they were faster than any of our planes. And did a lot of damage, and both in the air and on the ground. So where were you? How did you become a prisoner of war? We jumped out. A plane was on fire, and uh, eight out of the ten were able to jump out. And uh, the other two went down with the ship. I mean, there, one was badly wounded, and the other one was didn't have a chance to jump out. I think the plane blew up. So where, where were you held in captivity? What happened? How did, how did it...? Well, I was alone, and they were trying to find me with dogs and things like that, but they didn't find me for, well, at least a week. Huh. And I had rations or candy bars and more or less prepared for some of those things. And, and, uh, and I was walking towards well, towards the west, because that was more like the Russian area. Right. And trying to get away from the Germans. But uh, I was following railroad tracks, and one morning, uh, I used to walk at night, and then I'd hide in the bushes there in the woods, and and then uh, one morning I said, well, see, i got to find a place to hide, because the sun's coming up, you know? Uh -huh. But we went around a curve, and there was a little town there, and uh, they had, they called it a Wehrmacht, that was like a, a home police and a home guard, things uh -huh. like that, so they had the guns out. And, well, what they did, they sent me to jail. So I spent uh, almost a week in jail. They had political prisoners in there, underground too, that's where, uh, and then they, uh, it was dark, naturally. There's quite a few stories there, and boy, they, I could feel them all pinching me, and I think they were ready to eat me, you know. Who? Well, these political prisoners that were already in there, you know. Oh, really? So that was a, you know, they they were all, uh, but once a day, they'd let you come up and come up the stairs and go outside. Right. And get a breath of fresh air. Right. And back down again, they'd go, you know. That's why I said these guys are just skin and bones. You know? mm. But I don't know what nationality they were, but I almost guess what they were. You know, the, so. Were they all German? No, they weren't German. They were. I would. I'd say they were the. Well, the Jewish nationality. Gotcha. Okay. So they're very mistreated. You know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly what their background was, uh, mm -hmm. and I couldn't talk their language, and they couldn't talk mine. Well, they, well, what language did they speak? Were they speaking Hebrew or German? I don't know what, the, know. what it was. Okay. Okay. I couldn't speak uh, either one, you know. Right. right. Well, I was there for a couple of weeks. Then a group of prisoners were marching by, mm -hmm. and the uh, the cops there, actually the policemen, they said, let's put him with them, you know, and so 
to get rid of me so they didn't have to feed me, which they weren't giving me a heck of a lot. Right. And uh, I went with them. There was Frenchmen's in there, uh, an Englishman, which I got to be very friendly with. Uh -huh. And uh, he had been taken at Dunkirk. That was in 1939, I believe. That's when Germany and not England invaded France. And the Germans were there waiting for them. And the boats had gone back and they were stuck on the beach. Yeah. And they lost the, uh, the, their army and most of their navy there too. So that was a, a big loss for England, you know? Right. That's why they, after that, they were depending on us, you know? So where did you go with that group? Well, I don't know where they were all walking, you know, and so we, uh, I got familiar with the routine and this and that, and so they put us up in a barn at night, mm -hmm. you know, to tell the farmer, hey, we've got a, about 50 people here, and we'll sleep them in your barn, and they'll be gone in the morning, you know. Right. So we stayed in the barn. This Englishman and I stayed in the barn, and then we were on our own for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And picked up again by cops, and uh, again about the same routine. You know? So they, they, the cops didn't want to feed us. They said that was a military thing, and you know that uh, the food was very scarce. Right. I think I weighed 150 pounds, and. Uh, when I shot down, and then at, uh, in May, we shot down in March. In May, I was under 100 pounds. Wow. It was kind of a strict diet. You know. How long were you in captivity? So, uh, the end of the war, May 8th. What year? That's 45. So, okay, you said you went in in 43, right? Yeah. So was it more than a year that you were in captivity? No. It was less than that, but we were in training. Like I say, from basic training, they sent us to a college in Wisconsin, because uh, we were supposed to be cadets mm -hmm. and learn how to be an officer and all that. And meanwhile, they gave us 10 hours of flight training in a very small plane, okay. the Piper Cub. Right. So we were ready to solo, but they wouldn't let us solo. Mm -hmm. That was just to kind of keep us encouraged to stay with the program. You know? Right. From there, we went to, we were sent to California. They were going to decide what to do with us. Now, we're supposed to go to flight school, the pilot, or navigator, or bombardier. Uh -huh. So they gave us physicals and mentals and see which one we best suited for. Right. So, most of us, they didn't need us at all. And uh, they decided I was too short. I was a quarter of an inch too short. So, so I got thrown out of the program. Uh -huh. And then they decided they'd send me to mechanic school. Uh -huh. I came back again to halfway across the country to Amarillo. Texas? Yeah, yeah in Texas. And uh, I had mechanic training there. You know, very good training. From then, I was sent back to Arizona at gunnery school. Mm -hmm. I, I have I was trained for the trap turret and the ball turret, and uh, with the mechanic background, the pilot wanted me in the trap turret because it was right behind him. Right. And I could help out on landings and takeoffs and any problems during the flight, you know, mechanical problems and things like that shifting gas around and so, you know, 
So that was my duties, plus watching for enemy planes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, um, where, where are all the places that you traveled while you were in the military? Can you remember? Well, I ended up in Florida. Right. Right at uh, Tampa. Hmm. And they, they put us together with a crew, you know, the pilot and co-pilot. Right. So How large was the crew? How many people were in the crew? Ten. Ten, okay. There's a pilot, co-pilot, a navigator, and sometimes a bombardier. Mm -hmm. But they could, in our case, didn't have any bombardiers, so they put an enlisted man that could just toggle the bombs on the plane next to him or something like that. Right. Well, that's how... Uh, you, know, you just toggle the planes out and check the uh, bombardier and, and check the bomb bay and make sure they're all they're all out and all gone and that was it. Mm -hmm. I used to have to check the wheels, make sure they they'd come up or they'd go down. You know. Right, the hydraulics. Yeah. Uh -oh. That wasn't good at all. Um, so. In Europe, well, how many different places did you go in Europe? No, just Italy. Just <coughs> well, on the way over, we flew from. It took us a month to fly, fly to Europe. Right, a month. Yeah. Oh, you went. Where did you go? You went. To, you made stops. <laughs> well, we went from Tampa. We went to Hunter Field in Georgia, uh -huh. and got a brand new aircraft. Right, and then we, we had to. Uh, set the compass and all this stuff. Right. And check out all the all the different uh, systems and so we were there uh, almost a week. You know, getting used to the you know, we, and we flew it and everything else. And it was nice because it's like a brand new car. You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then they said, "Okay, you're on your way." So we had a they had a meeting and I said, "Okay, you're going." Uh, you're going tomorrow morning, you're leaving here, and, and from then on, everything's a secret. You know? So we we got the next morning, we went to our plane, and they gave us a, a big manila envelope, and they said, now your next stop is going to be Manchester, New Hampshire. Oh. And that was about 30 miles from my house. I wasn't allowed to call or tell anybody where I was. Uh, so, you know, I could almost walk home, you know? Yes, yeah, top secret. Yeah. You mean for good, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. And then and from there, uh, every day we said, well, you're going to take off tonight for, you know, for the Europe and all this, you know? But we went, we went to Gander. That was in Canada, in Newfoundland. Oh, okay. And then from there, we went to the Azores. Mm -hmm. That's a little island that's probably smaller than the Bermuda. It's in the middle of the Atlantic. Right. And uh, the navigator wasn't allowed to use any radios or anything. You're supposed to navigate and hit that right on the button, mm -hmm. which was thousands of miles, you know. The, but he did. He was able to say, hey, there it is, right up ahead. And, uh, so that was the Azores. And we stopped there to refuel. I think we stayed overnight. Okay. And then the next day, we had, the plane was all winterized. Right. But we were going to Africa. Oh. So we had to change all the oil and all that stuff. Summarize the plane for that trip. Uh-huh. And then from there we went to Marrakech in Africa. Okay. And then we went to, I think it was Tunisia. Mm-hmm. And then from there we went to uh, Foggia in Italy. Okay. And that was our base. And, uh, so we were able to, well, when we landed, they said, okay, take all your gear off and everything, and this is not your plane anymore, you know. So the plane went to a depot 
in, you know, some other crew, not a crew, but just a, a pilot, and, you know, the, they took it to Bari, Italy. So when everybody, anybody in Italy, you know, flying 17s, or right. shot a plane, or, you know, they, they go to this depot and it's, get one of those new ones that have been brought over. And, well, that's, uh, then we were there, we were issued a tent, and I think I, I think I helped put up a tent once in basic training. Uh -huh. Outside of that, I had no idea, and, you know, it was cold, and uh, we used to burn uh, the gas in the, in the barrel that we'd constructed, and, and we burn, uh, we burn 100 octane gas, mm. that's what the plane was. Had a tendency to leave a lot of soot because you know that was just a partial, uh, the flame was just a partial, you know, energy thing. Uh, right. This was another rock thing. It's pretty powerful, you know. But, but we did get the heat out of out of that, but uh, with a lot of soot. If you didn't watch your chimney, it would get blocked, and all of a sudden the thing would have more or less like explode, you know. The, get the fire out and everything else, and all the soot would come down in the tent in the middle of the night. And so that was a, that was a sunny Italy, was, plus a lot of rain. A lot of rain? Yeah. Okay. So how was the, um, how was the food? No, not very good. Mm -hmm. But I mean, nobody was, you know, there was no, really no big supply route that, uh... No, uh, no supply what? No, su no supply route, well... Oh, okay. You know, no regular thing, you know. Right. Sometimes we'd eat well for a few days, and, and there wasn't too much, but uh, they always gave something, you know, yeah. There's rations, uh, box, sea rations you could eat and things like that. So you'd never really go without it, you know. Right. Not like being a prisoner, you know. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, yeah, they did. They did pretty well there. I mean, they had us pretty tough anyway. You know. Uh -huh. Yeah, I hear you. Where'd you go when you go on leave? Uh, well, I, we didn't go anywhere. Oh, we, no? we, we didn't. We weren't there long enough. Gotcha. So, tell me about the end of your captivity. How did you become uncaptured? Well. We ended up, they put us on a train, and we ended up on the border of Germany and Czechoslovakia. And, uh, and it was not too far from the ovens, you know, they had ovens there, you know. The, so I was with this Englishman all this time as a prisoner. Right. And he noticed when the train stops, he says, this is trouble because this is where they one of the ovens that they have, you know. Yeah. So, so we had to. Well, we got off the train and everything. There was guards there and everything, and the, so we told them that uh, so we could could we go to the uh, restroom, you know. We'll be right back, you know. The, so we said, yeah, but come right back. I said, you know, you. So, and the. Train station in Europe is right in the middle of town, almost uh -huh. everywhere. So we went across the tracks and uh, looking for the restroom, and it just kept going. <laughs> you know, I mean, we did. <laughs> and it sounds foolish, but uh, no, but, uh, <laughs> it's clever. <clears throat> yeah, it didn't sound foolish at all. And one time, one of the first days I was in captivity, I could hear him coming. The uh, dogs and soldiers and things like that. Right. And I was all alone then. Uh -huh. Well, I took something, I don't know, a piece of metal or something like that, and I was hitting on the tracks, you know, as I was inspecting them, you know. Right. So then they came by and I laid a and started going again, you know. Mm -hmm. So they didn't think anything of it. I mean, I, I had. Uh, they didn't recognize my flight jacket, and I had some kind of a. At that time, I still had my electric flying suit with 
which had the electricity in there to be plugged in there on the plane. But yeah. I ended, ended up where that went to pieces, and I I just had a regular. So you know that didn't really look too much of a military. You know, they pay any attention to me. Just banging business. They, <laughs> so you know you had to have a little uh, imagination. You know. I see. Creative. Yeah. <laughs> Another incident will probably make you laugh. They'd give us. Uh, they call them a skate kit. Uh -huh. They had silk maps in there. Oh, okay. And uh, I did a lot of walking. And my socks were worn out. Yeah, I would imagine. So I took these maps and wrapped around my feet as socks. <laughs> so I was inter interpreted, you know, they interrogated me and everything and one time and I said, what in the hell are you doing with maps? Are you a spy or something? No, I said, those are my socks. <laughs> so I had three maps. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd get to wash one and then finally, you know, I'd put it on and wash another one and so it. So okay. Was that? That, was, that was original. <laughs> well, First time I've heard that one. Well, you know, that was one of the, one of the, you know, one of the things. Uh -huh. Well, it was, uh, I say, when I was banging on the tracks, uh, they didn't, they didn't take me at all, you know, they, they just let me go. I figured it was some kind of a specialist on tracks or something, you know. So you got to be um, in the escape kit. They had uh, forty-eight dollars in there. They had eight fives and eight ones. Oh, okay. And then uh, you know, they said, "Well, what would you do with that?" You know, here is the most people don't know what it is or anything. Right. So uh, the Englishman came up with the idea. He says, you still got that money? I said, yeah. I said, you know what that is? He says, those are visas to get into the America. Into America. It's like a passport. Right. So we said, we'll sell them. You know what I mean? We'll, anybody want to give us a little bread or something like that, we'll say, hey, this is picture of Washington, picture of this and that, but it looked very official. Right. And that, with that, you'll get right into the country. Uh -huh. And boy, we, we bought a lot of food with that. I bet you did. Uh -huh. Yeah, 48 bucks, that was a lot of money back then, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what do you do with money? I mean, you know, they, they don't even recognize it as money. We had to explain it to them. And oh, okay. So some other guys, oh, when the war is over, I, I can go right to the States with this, you know. They'd pay anything for that, you know. Give me all kinds of food, you know. Right. Okay, well. Okay. On the side of Yuma, there's a... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. We were in, uh, the Englishman and I, <coughs> we were in, uh, we were in jail. And we were on the ground floor, and, uh, bars in the window in the cell and all that, you know, but right. we could see like a playground. So we called the, uh, the, the women are watching all the kids playing and everything. And so we says, you want to make some money? He says, yeah. He says, well, so we'll pay anything. We'll give you like $50 and max and all this, uh, uh, you know, plate of potatoes or whatever you got, you know. Uh -huh. says, Okay, she says, yeah, then we'll get you a plate each, a plate of food. So they come in and sneak it through the bars and everything else, and, and they're waiting, they're waiting for their money. Right. Says, I'm sorry, lady, we don't have any money. Oh, they were screaming, why don't you have us put in jail? You know, so then I realized, <laughs> so then I realized but you know, that's the type of thing that would get you through, you know? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> There's a there's a question, but you you just took care of it. The part about um, pranks. I see that you had your you had your fill. Yeah. Good good for you. Good for you. Okay. Um. um oh, were you awarded? Yeah, you said you were awarded citation in a group, correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
How did you stay in touch with your family while you were going in the service? Oh no, that's that was out. You know what I mean? Well, as a, after I got overseas, right? I didn't. Uh, didn't happen. Huh? It didn't happen. Did you feel pressure or stress, you know, while you were a PFW or either or? Well, basically we were pretty well trained, uh -huh. you know, and you kind of knew. And then, like I had special training on the plane, mechanical, and uh, so I was actually able to talk to the pilot, and he was pretty well. You know, he said, hey, something's wrong here, that, you know, vibration. But we were able to, my training, his training, we did pretty well. And I thought, well, you know, they did it pretty well as much as they could do. Worked out. Yeah. Okay. But I don't think too many people would say, hey, they're just young kids and they uh, didn't know what happened, but we could handle that plane, you know. Was there any entertainment? Did you see any entertainers while you were overseas? Or in the military, either here or there? No. Okay. What did you think of the officers and your fellow soldiers? The officers and... Yeah. How did you get along with them? What did you think of them? They... They were just young like we were, uh -huh. and uh, they had their training, and they were well trained. And I mean, the rank uh, didn't mean anything. We were in uh, we we're in Italy, and we had a lot of rain, and they wanted to spread out some kind of hay and things like that, so you know, make a road. Uh, and uh, so they called all the sergeants out, all the military, but. Uh, so, I said, you know, it would go, and it was quite a bit of work to be done. Right. They, so you move jeeps and things like that. And uh, so I told the commanding officers, you know, he says, we called everybody out, the pilots and all the officers and everything. I said, we'd have a, a bigger, you know, a bigger crowd to get this thing done before it rained again and all that. You know? Right. He says, you've got a point there. Says, Why should those guys sit in there? The barracks, you know, they're not the barracks, they're the tent. So, they blew the, you know, they blew the whistle and everybody out. <laughs> everybody, everybody had a pick and shovel, you know. Okay. So they weren't too happy about me for that one. But, right, uh, I'm sure. Sure, maybe being that small helped you to escape faster, I yeah. guess. Or, <laughs> yeah. As you, as you uh, did these kinds of things. Um, do you recall the day that your service ended? Oh, yeah. Where well, were not, you? Not the service, I mean, the, uh, uh, the end of the war. Yeah. Where were you? I was in uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh-huh. Were you still a prisoner? No. Well, yeah. But they, they had uh, the police chief in, uh, in Czechoslovakia there. He was a pretty good guy. He said, you know, he says, I can't feed you. Right. So I said, I'm going to let you go. But you're going to get picked up again. He said, what you should do, he says, there's a, there's a few prisoners of war down the road and to explain to us where it was. And uh, it was across a glass factory. And these guys were doing etching for, for the royalty on glass and all this right. stuff, glass blowing and all. Mm -hmm. And they wanted, uh, they agreed with somebody, I know, they could use a prisoner of war to move crates and things like that. Right. So I said, why don't you go there and maybe you can make a deal with the, with the guys, you know, to do a little work and they'll, he said, yeah, he said, we ain't got it, I got nothing, absolutely nothing to give you. I get some at home from the wife, uh, you know, but. They don't get everything here, and I can't feed any outsiders or anything. Right. Well, my guys are hungry anyway, you know. Right. So we said, well, go over there. So we walked over there, and uh, I had I had a watch, uh, a GI watch, 
That was like a navigation and things like that. Uh -huh. I, I wasn't allowed one, but I told my mother, I said, hey, uh, buy me a watch before I leave, because I got to have a watch, you know. And I was always used to wearing one. And so, yeah, I'll get you one, get you one. Well, on the way over, the radio man got one, uh -huh. and the pilot and co-pilot. And, right. and the radio man said, no, I didn't get mine. So they gave him another one, you know. Yeah. So he had two. So I said to him, can I borrow your watch and I'll give it back to you? Right. So I said, you know, I, I promise I'll, uh, I still had it after the war. Oh, okay. You know, after we liberated. Oh, you didn't get it back. So, but <laughs> as a prisoner, on one of those last days, uh -huh. uh, in Czechoslovakia, the, the, the one of the guys says, I know I could bring something and I can trade it. So that you, anybody's got anything. Mm -hmm. the Englishman says, oh yeah, he's got a nice watch. You know, belongs to the government. Right. So he volunteered my watch, so naturally I, it went. That so, into that. Back in, uh, when we got back, we were in France. And we we're gonna. This is from Czechoslovakia. So well, you got to get back to the states. You know that it didn't. Nobody volunteered any transportation for us. I mean, right. The war was over and all that. So we bummed rides and different. Uh, so we got to France, like on the southern part, and they said, "No, okay, you got to go to Camp Lucky Strike after the cigarettes." I, I heard of this. Yeah. And you go there and you'll arrange your, your, uh, your transportation. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, this is a big tent outfit, you know what I mean? Uh, it's probably uh, enough there for 100,000 people, you know? Wow. Mm -hmm. But they said the different places, they had uh, Air Force uh, from Italy and they had uh, the what road, these tents were all marked, you know? Right. And you could find, like, your group. And he fell it, so sure enough, I found uh, the guy gave me the watch. And uh, he didn't say, glad to see you. Uh -huh. Nothing like that. No. Where's my watch? Right. And, uh, as <laughs> what well, did you tell him? As well, it saved my life. You know, so, so you, you, you know. Did he appreciate that? No. Uh. <laughs> I didn't even give him a Christmas card from him after that. <laughs> He lost his watch. You know? Right. Of course, the Germans took his away. Okay. But mine, the uh, I had a shoulder holster, uh -huh. and uh, they made sure they took uh, the magazines out of it. You know, they gave me back the gun. You know. Right. But I didn't particularly like that. I finally threw it out. You know, they didn't say, "Hey, he's armed. We shot him." But uh, he's carrying a gun. You know, and I thought I was better off without it because. A gun without any bullets is not much good. You know? Really? Yeah. The size of that, you got that right. Okay. Um, what did you do in the days and weeks after you uh, separated? Well, I was at Camp Lucky Strike. Right. And there was an airfield there. So I said, well, I'm going to the airfield. See what's going on over there, you know, because they had nothing to do. And uh, I went over there, and some lieutenants walking around and said, Hey, is anybody here an engineer for 17? I said, Yeah, I am. He said, You want to go to England? I said, Sure. So he said, Well, I got to have a parachute. Oh, there's no problem. I said, I got a chaplain to sign him up for you. you know. So I got the parachute. I got a parachute. Is that I'll go in. Uh -huh. So we get get to England, and he says, "Okay, see you later." Nothing about coming back. Okay. <laughs> so here I am in England. Oh, all right. No money or anything. And How, where did you fly from to England? From the states? Uh, from, or? No, from Lucky, from Lucky Strike. And where were they located at again? They were in France. Okay. They were assembling all the prisoners. Right. And they're filling up ships and. Now the officers all got a ride right away. Yeah. 
that the enlisted men didn't walk. Yeah, we weren't so lucky, you know, had to wait. So I said, well, I had a chance to go to England, and I took it, you know. Uh -huh. I thought he would take me back. Right, but he didn't. He didn't. How'd you get back? Well, I went to the Red Cross and borrowed some money. Uh -huh. So they'd give me something like twenty dollars, roughly, but in pounds and you know four pounds. Right. And, uh, it was roughly twenty dollars. So, you know, I said thank you. You know, and, you know, when I was gone, I went back again and I got some more. But about the third time, the lady said, "You know, you've had quite a bit." And you're only allowed once, but you've been here more than two or three times, you know? Uh-huh. So she says, you're afraid you're shut off, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> they cut you off, huh? Yeah. And then I said, uh, what I do now, so I went to shore patrol. Uh-huh. They're the ones with the boats, you know what I mean? And yeah. So I said, uh, I'd like to go back home, you know? So, said, you know, I... Actually, I should be in France, but yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. It was over. And so I uh, talked to some officers. Yeah, they said, oh, we got a room on, the, on LST. You know, when the, that's the one that opens up on the beach. Uh -huh. And the tanks yeah. go out, and LST, they call them. Right. Landing ship for tanks. Mm -hmm. They go five miles an hour. So. We get a ground, and they flat bottom. Right. They go right on the beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get on that. And from getting on to getting off in England to Norfolk, Virginia, was one month. It took me a month to fly over there, but when I come home, so I, I said to some other guys, well, you know, I, I had a few shady deals here and there. and, uh, and uh, I said, I think I'm going to the Pacific. They had two PT boats on the deck there. Yeah. And I bet, you know, as I know, it doesn't take a month to, between England and the United States. Right. You know, uh, but I said, you know, the war is still going on over there. And mm -hmm. I bet that's what we're going to, and these guys, well, the other guy, they were, yeah, you know, I had a little shady things too, and, you know, it wasn't everything like I'm supposed to be, you know, so. Right. Everybody had done something, and we're all end up on this uh, landing ship, you know. Uh -huh. But after a while, we went uh, around Bermuda a few times. Mm -hmm. They understand it was hurricanes, and they kept us there till it cleared up. And uh, but then we end up in Norfolk, Virginia. Okay. And boy, was I happy to see uh, you know the American flag and all that. You know. Did you get to use your GI Bill when you got out? For anything? Uh, well, I did. I was in the I was an apprentice in this printing business. Right. And they paid me so much a month uh, they would keep the trade. And well, besides my pay, so you know, they they figured it out on my pay, and so I did get a few months out of that. You know? What have you done for a career for the last since you got out? The last what is it? Well. Thirty years or more. So, what did you do for your career? I had uh, I had that printing, uh, you know, that printing uh, job. Did you? What did you? Was that through college or that was a job? No, that was that was a. It was an apprenticeship, and you became a union man, a right. gentleman, and all that. Right. So I made pretty good money on that. But it was all, all lead stuff and things like that. Uh huh. You know, my father was the foreman of the department, and he said, oh, I want you to take this, and he said, I want to go to college. He said, no, no, I'm going to do this. I said, hey, this ain't going to carry me through. So I'm 50 years old, uh -huh. and we're all called in to the boss and you know, the whole department. Said, well, so we're giving you guys a year's notice. You're going to be without a job in a year. Okay. So. I said, well, that's good. I tell that to my father, you know, I mean, he wanted me to, by that time he had passed away and everything. Uh -huh. But I said, you know, he said that I'd be set for life, but that looking for a job, but uh, that from scratch and uh, about 50, you know. So I went back, 
to the airlines. I knew mechanics and things like that, you know. Right. You know, I, was, I wasn't a full mechanic, but, you know, they, they recognized I had some training. Mm -hmm. But uh, as well, they said, we know what you can do. We said, we'll give you a job as a, a cleaner. Clean the, uh, you know, the, the aircraft. And, so I did that for 15, 16 years, and I got a good pension out of that. Uh -huh. So, I'm, I was pretty lucky. That's kind of a, you know, army related, you know, because they wanted somebody, they'd like somebody on the ground that's not stupid enough to walk into a propeller. That would be, that would help. That would be very no, helpful. That, no. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. You don't always hear it, and you can't see the propeller spinning. So, yeah. and a lot of a lot of people went that way. Now they got the jets. The jets can suck you in there. Right. So you know they they want somebody that's uh, is aware of that. So that's how they were glad that uh, I did around planes a little bit. And so that was how I ended up by uh, working for the. Airlines. You know. So, how many years did you do that? About fifteen, I guess. Mm -hmm. I got a good pension out of it. Okay. That I had thirty years with the with the uh, papers, you know. Oh, really? I did better with the fifteen years than this. So. What papers? Well, the newspaper, the printing I was talking about. Gotcha. That, that was, uh, and it was all lead and things like that. And, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the day, you melted lead down and sat all over again the next day. And, you belong to any veterans' organizations? Well, the Prince of War. Okay. And the Legion, I guess. Uh, American Legion. But the uh, Prince of War were about the, the best, you know, to make you aware of all the benefits and things like that. Right. But this, it gets smaller and smaller now, groups. You know. You've probably seen how few were there uh, last week. Well, last week at the hospital, um, it wasn't crowded, but the, the pews were, say, 70, 80 percent filled. Yeah. It wasn't too bad. Turnout was not bad at all. It was good. No, but there was a lot of, uh, well, she was there, and uh, a lot of others that can't drive. They had to have, so there was very few prisoners of war there. Oh, okay. I understand. You know what I mean? And that used, used to be overfilling, and not too long ago, you could, it was just prisoners of war. Uh -huh. But now, uh, and but they, it's uh, they're dying faster than the ordinary veteran anyway. You know? Right. Yeah, that's the word that I've gotten. It's the rate of about twelve hundred a day. Mm -hmm. Did you make any close friends in the service? Yeah. Or? Not so much. I think uh, afterwards. I mean, uh, you know, different. Prisoner war groups and they had conventions and things like that. And we made uh, we made good contacts. Cool. Um, did your military? This is we're getting down to it here. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well, it's hard to say. You know, the military uh, is pretty well organized. They don't send you out there uh, with no training whatsoever. Right. You know, they, I had I had all kinds of uh, first aid, things like that, you know, right. what to do for head wounds and this and that. And I uh, had quite a bit of training on that stuff. Uh, like I say, that was part of the military, and I thought I was pretty well educated, pretty well trained mm -hmm. for the task. You know, and just to put 12 people together and give them a plane and say, hey, go uh, two or 3,000 miles, and right. I, you know, you could do that and day after day. You know, it's, uh, you know there's some, some good training somewhere, you know. I used to fly over there. And, Basically, they were kids, you know. Right. 
anybody about 21 or 22, I mean, you're old, you know. <laughs> this way, uh, but uh, it worked out. Okay. Do you feel like there's anything else in the interview that, that you left out? Well, probably did, but I mean, right now I can't, uh, I, I, I think uh, war is a necessary thing. You think it is or isn't? It is. No. Uh huh. Why is that? Well, that's we generally don't uh, initiate these things. That they they brought to us, and we have to defend ourselves and things like that. You know? It's not something that we're looking for. It's just a lot of times we do it to help people out, you know? Right, right. So. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Joseph, Mr. Hamill. Okay, and you will be, um, you're going to get a copy of